The White House declared in a fiery letter that U.S. President Donald Trump will not participate in the House Judiciary impeachment hearing. Joining me now to discuss this is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari. Lisa, what can we expect in the next phase of the impeachment hearings? A lot more of this uh, ongoing circus of sorts. I always wonder what this looks like from an outsider's point of view, what the Canadians, for example, are looking at you know, Washington and what they're thinking about this uh, ongoing uh, kangaroo court that has been set up against the president here, uh, regardless of what one's political affiliation is or what they have, uh, what their emotional feelings towards Donald Trump is, because it seems like this president, regardless of policy, is, is just uh, conjures up emotional feelings for or against him more than anything else. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 it really belittles the, the position of presidency, uh, regardless of, again, what your uh, partisan uh, feelings are. Uh, in the next phase, on Wednesday, the Judiciary Committee will take a closer look at just the facts, just at whether or not this situation, the, the call with Ukraine, qualifies for impeachment. And according to that, they're going to have experts and lawyers come in who are um, who, who can who can attest to whether or not this violates any laws uh, and what the next steps will be to either uh, refer him for impeachment or not. Um, of course, Donald Trump and those around him refused to uh, be there, first of all, for logistics, because they scheduled this knowing full well that Donald Trump would be in London for the NATO conference. Conference. Uh, and secondly, because they feel as though this is a, again, a lack of respect for the president and uh, to bring him there would be really just, um, you know, setting him up for, 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 for disastrous situation. So, um, you know, as someone watching this, both as an American citizen and someone who's, who's a journalist, it's, um, it, it's upsetting. It's upsetting that this is what's focused on when there are so many important issues going on around the world, uh, where our attention is needed, where our national security is concerned, where our assets are. Uh, and again, time and taxpayer money is going towards something that is just unbelievably um, a, a waste of time more than anything else. Lisa, some news out of Iran and that the government there says their missiles are aimed directly at 21 U.S. bases. Yeah, uh, that could help us sleep well at night, right? Uh, this is the Iranian regime flexing their muscles once again. Uh, how, as you and I have covered over the last few weeks, the ongoing protests in Iran, the people of Iran coming out onto the streets, burning tires, stopping traffic over what was called the, the catalyst being uh, the price of, of gasoline. Uh, but of course, the people of Iran um, showing their disenchantment of 40 years of this rule more, more than anything else. Uh, and now every time this quiets down, the regime remembers that their main goal is to keep the people quiet, but, but then use that as a springboard into the, the region and to you know, expand their uh, influence, their hegemony, their Shiite dominance of the region. And that's exactly what they're doing here, saying that, you know, you might think, you know, talking to the United States, you might think that you're you're far away from us and we don't have access to you. But guess what? We're, we're pointing our missiles at 21 of your bases and assets right here in the region in the Middle East. So we we are, you know, we, we have you covered and we will um, threaten and we will act upon those threats. The same thing goes for Israel. They've always threatened the United States and Israel in the same breath and they continue to do so. Uh, here there was a, a video of a... Um, a, a a mullah, uh, a minister of sorts, um, threatening the United States and Israel to take them off the map, to go after their asset, the U.S. assets in the region. More muscle flexing, more more evidence and more proof that the Iranian regime is not going to be easy to be to de deal with. Uh, and again, remember, there are people in the White House, there are um, employees in in Washington who want to push forward a another nuclear deal, knowing full well that this is the uh, the the Iranian regime that we're dealing with. Um, just more threats, and every day it just gets gets worse. Yeah, and still with the regime in Iran, they've warned that it may seriously reconsider its commitments to the UN atomic watchdog. Tell me more about that. Right. So if that's the only way that we've had any sort of. Um, responsibility or watching over their nuclear uh, activities was the the IAEA and the of course the Iranians have such a a comfortable place at the UN which is just so so um, 
uh, ironic, uh, for lack of a better word, um, putting the, the Iranian regime on committees that have to deal with human rights and women's rights when there's, that, that just doesn't exist in their vocabulary back at home. When we know full well what they're doing to the people of Iran, what they're doing in Iraq and Lebanon and Yemen, and the list goes on and on. Um, so, you know, it, it's uh, for them to say that we're going to pull out of the the our commitment uh, to the the only committee that has held them responsible uh, for their nuclear uh, agenda, they're going to pull out of it. That just shows exactly what they're up to, what their agenda is, how they how they um, hope to push forward. And again, the only the only um, saving grace the Iranian regime had, the only way they thought that they were going to make the, make it through, was to count on the Europeans to bail them out. And when the Europeans found it very difficult to side with the Iranian regime, now they feel like they have to go at it alone. And what they're going, what are they going to do? They're going to play tough. And they're going to pull out of any agency that's going to hold them responsible. They're going to make threats against the United States, against Israel, against the Europeans, and they're going to move forward from there. The drug wars continue in Mexico, Lisa. A recent Mexican gun battle near the Texas border left 21 people dead. Is it getting to the point where we as tourists should potentially skip Mexico for our holidays? That's what it looks like. And many, many of those threats have been issued, although people I know from uh, the United States certainly um, make the trip down here in uh, Southern California. Of course, it's the quickest trip um, to a, a nice, warm destination. But, but again, these stories make people think twice. I don't know. These stories don't usually usually take place near the resorts, but um, there have been cases, uh, especially near Cancun, where they are getting closer and closer to areas where tourists frequent. Now, that aside, if you've seen pictures of this this um, police station where this, this gun battle took place, it looks like Swiss cheese. I mean, the building is riddled with gunshots. Uh, and, you know, where are these, these uh, uh, drug cartels getting these guns from? I mean, you know, just this week, Donald Trump announced that he will um, label the drug cartels as terrorists. So they're going to be dealt with in the same way that, that terrorists are dealt with. They're on the, the, the national terror list at this point. Uh, and when you look at the reality of the situation just south of the border, it's amazing that half of this country feels like we don't need this type of protection at the border. They have guns, they have money, they have the, the agenda, and they have this violent way of dealing with situations just like terrorists do. Uh, and we don't have to look at the Middle East for terrorists. They're just at the foot of our country. I know that the, the Canadians look at this just as seriously as we do here in the United States because they have a way of getting through and they have a way of climbing up and, and crossing into Canada as well. Um, so, yes, it looks very bad. This is just south of our, our border. This is right here in Mexico where, um, as you said, many, many people have... I had my wedding in Mexico. I know a lot of people have their you know destination weddings they have conferences in mexico they have you know weekend getaways in mexico honeymoons etc and we just had the, the story of the american family uh that was taken down in a very similar violent uh fashion don't you think the mexican government would kind of give their heads a shake saying this is a big part of our industry tourism we got to get this under control Absolutely. But it looks like it's going to get worse before it gets better in Mexico and they want to go at it alone. They have they resent any sort of U.S. help, any sort of handout, any sort of commitment by Donald Trump to help them out. Just just this week, they said that they they want to be left alone to take care of this. And, you know, in a way, we know that the president is very serious about this. But then again, why not go go forward? You know, Canada, the United States, Mexico, this threesome, uh, they need each other. It's not just economic. It has a lot to do with national security as well. And it behooves all three partners to look at this seriously, to help one another out, and to be on the same side when it comes to dealing with these uh, terrorists. And it's exactly what they are. And when Donald Trump calls them terrorists and you have people, half of this country, against fighting that, that concept of keeping us safe, um, it, it's upsetting. It's upsetting that we can't get on uh, on the same side and can't get on the same page uh, to understand what we need to do to keep ourselves safe, to keep people who cross over into Mexico on vacation safe, to keep people north of our border safe. Uh, I think it, 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 there should be a, a, a task force just to deal with terrorism across these three borders. Now, speaking of terrorism, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says 74 convicted terrorists released from prison will have license conditions reviewed. He vows to strengthen prison sentences following the recent London stabbings. 
Yeah, so this stabbing story was very, very upsetting, not only because of the timing of, of the year, um, walk, you know, going into the holiday season, but also because, you know, it, it seems like the moment any country, particularly in Europe, they like let their hair down, they take a sigh of relief, there's another um, do-it-yourself type of terror attack. It was claimed by ISIS, and most importantly, this individual already served time for terrorism. I mean, let that sink in. He's a terrorist. Why was he roaming the streets? Why was he roaming the streets able to carry out another type of attack like this when all they need is a kitchen knife? And that's exactly the, the message that ISIS gives on YouTube videos, recruiting young people all over the world, particularly in Europe and the West, to use common, common, common items that you have in your home, in your kitchen, in your car, use whatever you can to kill people. And no number is, is insignificant. They're not looking to carry out, you know, a Al-Qaeda 9-11 type of attack. Even if you kill one person or two people, that's enough. And when you know that that's the agenda of these individuals, when you know that this particular individual carried out an attack and served time for it, why was he, why was it such an insignificant sentence where he was allowed to roam the streets once again? And that's exactly what Johnson saying that now, um, should he be successful in the D December election uh, coming up in about a week or so, uh, he will keep his promise and revisit these sentences and, and deal out much more significant sentences for individuals like this one. Thousands of protesters have taken to the streets of Hong Kong in fresh protests after a week of victories, but Lisa, they're still pretty angry. They're very angry, and I, I wonder if this has more to do with not just their own um, progress and their own victories when the protesters have become more violent, they have gotten a, a better reaction, and that particularly coming from the United States, Donald Trump just last week signed a bill you know, offering support to the people of Hong Kong. They were playing uh, the national anthem of the United States. They were praising, they had a protest, a march, I should say, uh, just to thank Donald Trump, which is very interesting because you don't see any of that here in the West. Uh, he's much more popular, it seems like, in other parts of the world, but offering that hand and offering that support to the people of Hong Kong went a long way for the protesters. So they were invigorated by this, they became emboldened by this. And as we also see China diminishing in the um, in the conversation about a U.S. deal with China, I think that also empowers the people of Hong Kong to say, if there's any time to get what we want or at least get the message across, this is the time to do so. A horrific story coming out of India, Lisa, reports a veterinary doctor was gang raped and then her body was set on fire and dumped under a bridge. Horrific. And the charred body was found on the outskirts of a southern city. Hundreds of women have taken to the streets in protest. Yes. The protests are about how women are treated, how the police department dealt with this, how society looks at a crime like this. Uh, this young woman, a very accomplished woman, a veterinary doctor, um, that was just leaving work, and these four men who were um, drunk and decided that they saw her, and they decided that they would flatten her tire, uh, point out that she has a flat tire. And what they did was then they gang raped her, they set her body on fire, they dumped the bodies. I mean, it's horrific what they did to her. Uh, and it seems like the police department didn't act fast enough. Once they found out that she was missing, they, act, they asked her family very, very inappropriate questions such as, did she, was she having an affair? Did she run off with someone? You know, blaming it on the woman. Uh, and these protests are about her case, but more so about how their society treats a case like this or how the a society treats violence against women, um, how a, a society treats, you know, that femininity, uh, you know, the fact that she was raped and, and you know, n nothing was done about it or there was no urgency to find these rapists. Um, it's horrific. And, uh, you know, I'm glad we're bringing some some light and some attention to, onto the story because I think so, so quickly we kind of go over these stories and, you know, it's, it's another country. That's just the way it is. That's how women are treated. But where is the outrage here in the West when we pride ourselves on being such, such champions of women's rights uh, and you know what are people here in the streets uh, you know when there's a women's march uh, you know uh, here in the United States or um, you know all over Europe you know 
know, what do we talk about? We talk about things like birth control and abortion and things that, you know, obviously are more of a case by case situation and it should be really left up to each individual or at least the state, not the nation. Um, and here you have it, you know, you have how did their society deal with something like that? And not to compare, but it's just that we wish we had more champions of, hum of, of women's rights speaking out for these individuals and giving their their plight a bigger and higher platform. Lisa, a lot closer to home, a woman in Montreal who was arrested for not holding onto an escalator handrail has been awarded $20,000 in damages by the Supreme Court. Bella Corosian was riding the escalator at a metro station in 2009 when the officer stopped her because she wasn't holding onto the handrail. Tell me more about this bizarre case. How funny, she must have had one bad afternoon in 2009 and a decade later she's gifted $20,000. I don't know, it might be worth her time uh, to have gone through that. Basically, there is a warning sign that says hold on to the rail when she gets to the bottom. She's checking her handbag for something and wasn't holding on to the rail. And when she gets to the bottom of the escalator, a police officer says, you weren't holding on to the rail, you have to come with me. She refuses. You know, they go back and forth. She's one tough cookie, it sounds like. Uh, basically she was then fined not just for the not holding the handrail but also for not complying with the police officer and uh, I guess it took her a decade to prove that this was not a law but it was just a warning and the police officer had no right to search her to stop her to question her uh, and to fine her uh, so she won the case she actually I think sued for double that and a bit more maybe 45,000 if I remember correctly and she got half the amount she was awarded that by a court uh, and now she can go back to wherever she was and, and do a little bit of shopping with that $20,000 so it took a decade but hey <laughs> And make sure she holds onto the handrail when she's doing her shopping, right? Sure, yes. Yeah. <laughs> or not if you get $20,000, but we'll, we'll see. Buy a lot of shopping. That's right. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Thanks again, Lisa. My pleasure.